Hello, Lawrence. How are you? Hello Damien, how are you? Okay, so um, as the video is beginning, I think I should um, say a few things. This is my first ever uh, Instagram live, and um, um, it's courtesy of the book market Nigeria. And I'm supposed to be taking questions on, um, on um, publishing in Nigeria, the business, the life. Hi, Engine Room. Thank you, Damien. So, um, how will this work? I think I, I will just um, start by just um, talking. Then, as soon as I see pictures, as as, as I see your, your your questions scroll up, I will try and answer them. Um, so, I'm I'm Egusa Emerson. Like I said before, I'm a writer. I'm a uh, I graduated from I'm, I'm a writer and a publisher. Uh, I trained as a medical doctor in the University of Benin. I graduated with the class of 1999. Um, what I'm sure most of us will recognize that I left. We actually received our certificates in June of 2000, but 1999 was written on them. So um, it was the strike problems and the uh, riots of the 90s. Um, I also um, I published my first novel in 2008. Um, it was an alternate history, modern mystery called um, To St. Patrick, with um, the Farafina imprint of Kachifo Limited. My second novel came out as an e-book first in 2011, then the print edition came out in 2012, in the middle of 2012, and that was Fine Boys, the um, more popular of my novels. I've had my short fiction published in online magazines and also in print. I... Um, um, segued out of medicine really slowly, but by 2013 I was running um, Kachifo Limited, my publishers, as a as the chief operations officer. In, in other words, the general manager. I eventually left um, Kachifo Limited and founded my own firm with um, my business partner, Aumuli Ojogu. Um, we founded the company in March of 2016, got it registered, and operations started in July, on July 1st, 2016. So we are in our third year now. Abby, 2016 to 2017, one year, 2017 to 2018, one year, 2018 to 2019, one year. So we are in our fourth year. We are in our fourth year. By July of next year, we would have completed four years and we will be entering our fifth year. 
the business of publishing most times you, you find out that um, what what um, people tend to talk about is um, is um, how do you describe this is you need to dis- you need to understand okay so what is publishing itself and at times you might need to go back to the history of publishing in Nigeria and the reasons why things are peculiar but we'll just start with um, Okay, now, okay, first question, engine room. <laughs> no, no, I was not a confra boy. Um, I was in university when, when the violence was really bad. But you, you have to understand that by, there was, okay, let's put it this way. The confraternities were founded by non-conformists. And one of the things about non-conformists is that they found something, it becomes popular, then conformists join. So by the second or fourth or even fifth generation of the founding of what they founded, you know, by the time I was in school, the non-conformist thing to do was not to blend confra, was not to join conf- confraternity. That was the non-conformist thing to do. Unlike uh, at the time they were founded. So the act of rebellion was actually not, not, not joining because it had become too easy or it had become a bit too trite to, to join. So you found yourself as a nerd or a geek and your nose was up in the air. You were like, what am I going to do with these people? Who am I going to follow these people? You were basically counterculture and counterculture was not to be in comfort. So, no, I, w- I was not a comfort boy. Oh, thank you, Damien. Thank you so much. So, what, what you find about um, publishing is that so there are two major forms of publishing. There's um, traditional publishing and the self publishing now this is the the reason why i split them this one the reason why most people split them this way is just the idea of the role that publishing companies play the role that publishers play in relation to content creators and also to the readers so for ease of description a traditional publishing firm will um will see content that it likes We'll, we'll see. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm actually, I'll get your question very soon. So a traditional publishing firm will see content that, that, that it likes, approach the creator of that content, request a grant of rights, which is temporary, of course. No, not, don't ever, ever sell your rights outright. In for, we'll, we, we'll see a grant of rights. We'll seek a grant of rights from the content creator, request those rights for, for a term, maybe five to ten years, and for a region, the world, Anglophone West Africa, Europe, or Nigeria, and will spend their money to to create the best book that they can, and they will pay the author royalties for granting them the privilege of exploiting those temporarily granted rights. Um, self-publishing is, is self-explanatory. It's when you have your content, you have, you have your book, and you find that not as many people have as much faith in your content as you do or that your work is really really niche and you publish your work yourself so you so you could do you could do the entire worker yourself go to public and uh, go to a printer go to a designer or you could meet a publishing services um company and have them offer you those services for a cost so you find most publishing services contracts are quite plain they're state it out clearly that they are, that you have not granted them any rights and they are offering this service to you for this amount of money and at the end your contract with them ends when they deliver your your book to you and, and here now comes the usual marketing uh, issue uh, but i i published book and they didn't market it for me if a publisher could market your book likely they would have requested for the rights themselves so you need to split the way you look at the business so some publishers offer marketing or sales and distribution separate from or even as part of their publishing services contract but always look at it really 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 closely because publishers are some of the worst booksellers that that you can get it's a very specialized um, talent to be able to sell books to to be able to push books into the market and get people to to read them especially when the copyright is not yours when you have no rights to the co- to, to, to the content so what you'll find is that the first set of the contract will be for them to deliver your books to you. Then they'll take a fraction of those books and try to put them in the market. This is for the second, this is for the self-publishing route. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm into your, your question. How robust is the Nigerian 
content creative fiction readership hmm how do you describe this um it, it's there it's yeah most of this thing it it's about the fandom it's about the fandom so a culture as is the culture is in renaissance the, the culture came back in the me in the early 2000s you know with um uh, fiction by um, Elona Bila, um, Chimamanda, and the bustling of the internet and uh, websites like AfricanWriting.com and AfricanWriter.com. So, and that tradition has grown, you know, with um, businesses like Okada Books. There's, there's a vibrant um, readership out there, really enthusiastic. And you find, and, but most people, most people counter that by saying that, but at the book readings, it's the same faces you see. But that is where life has always been. It's the fans, the, the biggest fans, the small vocal minority that push everybody to read what they are reading. It's, it is what it is. There are people who are fans who you don't hear about who go out and buy those books. So it's vibrant. The market expands to fill the space. It's what it is. So if you find out that you can only do 2,000 copy print runs or 5,000 copy print runs, that's what the market can take. But books have always been slower. Uh, most times we find that we are over expecting, we are, we, are, we, are, we are expending a lot of energy thinking that you will get much more content if you are, um, as you are comparing books to music or books to film. Books are writing itself and fiction and reading. It's not passive entertainment. It's one of the few art forms that demands almost as much effort in enjoying it as it was in creating it. Because you're sitting down quiet, expending time where you cannot turn and do something else, engaging a text, reading it, even if it's passive. But that is what you are doing. So most times, yeah, I, I think um, it's vibrant enough. The, there's the hardcore set of fans who enjoy who enjoy nine who enjoy the the content that we are creating and and you find that that yeah your books will sell because it's also a balance of the the duty of the reader is to quality writing not to any book you throw in front of them so if your book is bad the story will spread and people will not just buy but if your book is good if it's if it touches a cultural milestone or just writes the zeitgeist then it's um, then it's something that can really be beautiful. Oh, thank you, Cici Lawyer. So, so um, like, like I was saying, so when you think about um, publishing, so so let's go back to traditional publishing. Oh yeah, go ahead. No, 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 uh, Damian. Two things you are you are mixing up. A self-published book is a self-published book. Traditional publishers have nothing to do with it. A business can offer traditional publishing, can do, can can engage in traditional publishing, and also offer publishing services, which is really cool because because the, the major idea is that you want, um, how do you describe it? You 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 you, as a traditional publisher, you've developed specialized skills. And one of the dangers you can, one of the issues you can have is that you can now have, you can, you can either lock those skills by being a puritan and saying that no, it's uh, no, we don't really do self-publishing, or you can have people who have more faith in their work than you do, or who, who know what they have is quality, even or even who even who are even publishing work that you are not necessarily specialized in. Let us say, for example, Christian fiction is a market that I know nothing about. But I know editing, I know good fiction, I know good writing, I know good book design. So if a, somebody who's, who's written that kind of book that I, I have no expertise in selling, will I, will I engage my money in selling something I know I don't know how to sell? No, I would offer publishing services to that person. Make sure the person gets the best book possible. Then, um, as a separate sales and distribution agreement, or if, my publishing, if I'm the kind of company where my publishing services and distribution and marketing are merged together, then I will push the book in. In, in, into the market on behalf of that reader, but the major I, the major thing is this: is that you can never force, you can never ever claim or pretend to a writer that you're taking their money, that you're going to force readers to buy their book. What you can offer them 
the talent that you will have is something called discoverability. You can offer them discoverability. You can tell them that ride on my reputation for being, like for example, Native Landscape Press is the uh, regional publisher for Chimamanda. We handle Anglophone rights for West Africa. You can now say, wherever you see Chimamanda's books, your books will be beside them. Because what we'll do is that whenever our bookshops come to us for new supplies, we'll say, oh, look at this new book that has come. But we will not be able to put a gun to a reader's head and force them to pick up the book. But your book will gain discoverability. So a proper book distributor like um, Ro- like Ruby Knights and the rest, that's what they offer. They offer discoverability. They push your book out there based on their reputation and you gain. And what do they earn? They earn not royalties this time. They earn a commission from sales and they push and they remit your funds to you, back to you, because it's all yours. Unlike the traditional publishing where the publisher is engaging in the business, almost like music, music publishing is engaging in the business, then paying you royalties for granting them the privilege of doing business with your work. So it's, it, the lines are really thin, but the major point is copyright resides with the author throughout, but for traditional publishing, the author rents the rights to a publisher who exploits those rights and pays royalties. In self-publishing, the author has their book, six services, either from, either by themselves, doing everything themselves, or what we call vanity publishing or subsidized publishing. It, it, it has many euphemisms because it's been looked down upon. But all of them mean the same thing. The rights reside with the proprietor, with the writer of the book, who pays for the services and engages the market themselves. The fear you have is that what everybody dreads is to have your garage with 10 or 15 cartons of your book that you couldn't sell. But that's the risk of having faith in your work and pushing it out there and saying that you are ready to pay for it instead of waiting. Instead of taking the idea that you couldn't find a publisher as a, as a kind of hint that maybe I need to do something more. But there have been people who have, in, the, in this new world where the gatekeepers are all falling, where the gatekeepers are all dying away, people, they've had, you've had great stories of self-published books that did really well. Uh, of course, Fifty Shades of Grey. Is, 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 is one of them that started as fan fiction, s- s- uh, started as um, a Twilight fan fan fiction and blew up the world and basically was, if you, could, if you could find a single piece of work that made the Amazon Kindle a success, it was Fifty Shades of Grey, self-published book originally, before eventually a publisher came and acquired those rights. So it happens, poetry is so specialized that many publishers do not have the skill or the ability to sell poetry. And kind of instead, what they do is that they offer poetry is usually a lot of times self-published. They breaks open and eventually they, they get their rights. Or work online, publishing online on Kindle Direct, publishing on Create Space and all those online media, even on, on Okada Books with the ease with which you can break through and publish your book. But the obverse, the side effect is discoverability. In this din of voices, this loud noise of voices, you find that a lot of people, it's so difficult to be discovered. It's so difficult to be the diamond in, 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 in the rock. You know? So, approaching the publisher, I should actually take notes. So let me carry paper. Okay, so that's yeah, got the exercise bike and uh, pajamas hanging from, from from the door. Let me hide that one. I'm in the room, kicked the kids out. One of them was playing tablet. Turned off. I was watching uh, Amazon. So let's talk about. So what next can we discuss now? So we can discuss. Um, let's discuss traditional publishing itself. And the first thing, of course, is approaching the publisher. So how do traditional publishers get the content? How do we see the books that we want? So approaching the publisher. That's a doctor's handwriting. It's really horrible. So approaching the publisher. Usually, um, like I said, you have to think of, so what was the first major gatekeeper that crashed in the publishing industry? I think the first major gatekeeper was the word processor and the ability to write, uh, to use pen and, and to be able to, the idea that cut and paste became 
copy and paste became something you did with a mouse instead of something you did with scissors and glue. So when you were adding new content, you would cut, write more, then glue it in that space. That was actually what the copy and cut and paste was really. But if you, what the word processors did was that the word processor blew open the space because all you did that was, you didn't even need to type out and copy and type out. You had a computer, you put, you put something up in the ether, you could email it and all that. So what, what that did was that that now overwhelmed publishers with, 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 with content. So you find a lot of publishers, um, a, a, a lot of publishers uh, put up walls to try and protect themselves from the overwhelming idea. But the classic way was this. A publisher usually asked for submissions. You submitted to a publisher. And, and uh, what you now did was um, you sent in your work. Not all of it. You sent a sample of your writing. So it was three steps. One, you sent what was called a query letter. What is still called a query letter or now called a query email. And which was usually one page. Two, you sent a sample of your writing. Three, you sent your bio, your biography. Now, each of these things, I know three, no, a query letter, a sample of your writing, and a synopsis. Now, each of these things served a function. So the query letter introduced you to the publisher. It was, it's usually a three paragraph letter or email. The first paragraph is who you are, what you seek, and how you heard about the publisher. Now, this is the part where you actually show off a bit of knowledge. So if you, your, your salutation, if you know the specific editor in the publishing house that you're addressing in the submissions department, that gives you bullet points. So just saying, dear editor, you say something like, dear Amaka, ah, the, the, it will pick the publisher's interest. Then your first paragraph, you introduce yourself and how you heard, if you were referred to them, if you heard about them from somebody, that was where you, you, you did that. Then your second paragraph was, of course, what your book w was about. So a typical first paragraph would read, uh, my name is um, Dear Editor, my, my name is um, Egosai Maswen, I seek publication for my um, novel, Fine Boys, which is complete at 98,000 words. I heard about you after we met at so so and so place and you asked me to submit. I heard about you by seeing your novel that I bought in a supermarket. Then the second paragraph. My novel Fine Boys is um, a coming of age story set in the Midwest of Nigeria and follows five friends who maneuver Nigerian education in the 90s. It's a post-Biafran post story about the Nigerians born after the Civil War and about identity and about right or wrong. Then the third paragraph was where you now express your bona fides, uh, what made you the right person to write this book. And you would engage um, stuff like, um, um, so I, I finished, I graduated uh, from that school and I, the, and I studied... Um, how would you describe it? I studied writing with so and so person. This is not the place where you say that my mother really likes this book or my sisters enjoy it. No, no, they are not the ones to. This is not where you. And the letter is on. In the old days, the letter would be on plain paper, or if you had the personal letter, the personal letter, there was no need for frills. The publishers see this thing all the time, and what they want is just something straightforward and simple. That's done. So, what your query letter introduces you and what you are presenting. The next thing you need, you need is a synopsis. Now, usually the tradition is a one-page synopsis. And the logic behind that is that if you cannot summarize your story in one page, then you don't know what you're writing. If you cannot actually summarize it in two sentences, you don't know what you're, you don't know what you're doing. The more you engage a piece of work that is yours, the more you know about it. So you sent a one-page plot synopsis with a note or two on theme. You could do anything you wanted. And that plot synopsis is with spoilers. This is not the time to say what you normally see on the back of video cassettes or the back of novels where you say, will he survive? Will he get away? Read to find out. No. You give a plot synopsis with uh, everything included, both, um, um, the, cont um, both the, the major plot points, the spoilers, who died, who survived, who ran away. Now, the plot synopsis tells the publisher, okay, this is what this person is engaging. Now, the third thing you now sent was a sample of your writing. 
Now this is usually described as the first three chapters, the first 50 pages, or the first 10,000 words, whichever is longer. Now usually the first 50 chapters is really important to understand what, the first 50 pages is really important to understand what that means. In, in, in publishing, a page is equal to 250 words. So, for instance, when Yale was talking about how many words, it's actually the way we are measuring length. Because depending on how the, a book is laid out, it can mean anything. But a page is usually 250 words. So, if the um, publisher now says, send me, 50, send me the, in your writing sample that you're using to approach a publisher, the first three chapters, of course, if the usual chapter is 2,000 or 5,000 words, that makes sense. But there are some people who write very sh short chapters. My, my sister, the serial killer, has a chapter that is two sentences. So you send the first three chapters, the first 50 pages of a properly formatted manuscript, which will be about 11,000 words, or the first 10,000 words, whichever is longer. Now, what does a writing sample say? So you've introduced yourself in the query later. You've claimed a lot of things in your synopsis. You've made a lot of mouth. The writing sample is where the Submissions editor now sees whether you can back up the mouth that you've been making. And so that's what that is about. Now, after your submission has been sent, two things can happen. Three things, actually. One, the publisher is not interested and sends you a really nicely worded, um, a nicely worded re rejection. Apollo tell you that they, they read your work with interest, but it's not for them, and they wish you luck. One, which is called the form re rejection, which can be quite... Paradoxically, it can be quite rude because it's just flat and you know that this person is not engaging you. Or two, the publisher can send you a personalized rejection where they explain why they don't think it's ready for them and why even though they really loved what you were doing, tips and notes on what you can do and if you can send it to them after a certain time when, you, when you've engaged those things that, you, that, they, that they found out about your work. So that's a personalized rejection which is really... When you not see anything, do it's one of the most pleasant things to, to, to receive that. Thank you, somebody, else, even though they told you no, but at least they took the time out to engage what you were trying to do. Then finally, the publisher can say, oh, we really liked your submission. Can we see the entire manuscript? Now, that is really beautiful. So they ask to see the entire manuscript. You send them the entire manuscript. Usually, from the day you submit or from the day the submissions window opens, most publishers will tell you that give us eight weeks before sending us a reminder about your submission. You have to understand that they are overwhelmed with work and their um, desk is full. So most times, and it's it's one of the um, um, you know the eighty twenty rule of business, where eighty percent of your effort will give you twenty percent of your earnings, or twenty percent of your effort might just blow up and give you eighty percent of your earnings the paradox of, of chance and probability. So most times you find that reading, opening a submissions window, you get a lot of noise, a lot of stuff that might not really, you might add, uh, spend two years on, on submissions and not find anything that is that you like. Most publishers would actually prefer just referrals, a mutual friend whose judgment they trust, saying that, please, Egosa, e e look at this book that I just, that I do, oh God, I love this book, by, by the way. Love, 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 love. And Basi Ikbi personalized and sent me a note for Egosa. Thank you for believing. One of my one, one of my closest friends. Anyway, so as I was saying, so you send the entire manuscript. And the publisher sees it and likes it. The publisher offers you a contract. Or the publisher reads the entire manuscript and discovers that it's not for them. And tells you, oh, sorry, they read the entire manuscript, but they don't think it's for them. Or the publisher sends, sends, the, um, sends the story back to you and says, and says, you know what, it's not yet re re ready. A second version of the mild rejection. If it takes some time to make a few changes, that they will really enjoy it. So I think that's the, those are the things that um, happen with, with traditional publishing. Now, so let us say your manuscript is now accepted for publication. The publisher sends you a contract. Um, this is the time when we find ourselves talking about um, how we engage the business and the, and, and the marketplace. 
So uh, what do we do now? You are, you've received your contract. The publisher is telling you that, please, can I have world rights or can I have Africa rights? Most publishers will ask you for world rights. It depends, it depends on what you, it, it depends on what you want to do with them. They will ask you for world rights. You get your world rights. You, you, you either decide, no, I want to retain certain re- re- regions. Most publishers will ask you for a decade, for 10 years. But it's a tendency towards just giving out five years now. And the contract would also have a clause saying that the terms in this contract are reviewable. The terms in the contract are reviewable after two years. Of course, it's a good faith review. You don't just go after it and say, no, I don't want this one again. I want this percentage. No, because that would spoil the contract. And they will have clauses for when to break the contract. They will have clauses for breaches that could actually break the contract. They will have protections for you, protections for the publisher from copyright infringement by you, um, caveats that make things happen. Now, money, the publisher will not offer you royalties. Usually, first-time publishers, royalties are calculated at 10% of cover price. Now, this term seems really easy, 10% of cover price, which means that for a 2,000 Naira book, a first-time author will be collecting 200 Naira a book. You're like, ah, for what? 2,000 Naira, I'm only collecting 200 Naira. But before we get to that, let's even talk about the complication of what actually happens in our market at times. We don't have cover price rules here. We don't have book price con- 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 controls. Book price controls, I think they exist in Europe. I think Germany has a lot of them. I think the UK and everything. And what's the idea of book price control? It means that it's a simple agreement among in the book industry, which means that a book you find on the roadside, the price you put on the cover and a book you find in the most expensive air-conditioned bookshop will have the same cover price. Now, you don't really expect that to happen here let's say a book that you find in jdz in a in a, in a shop right at, at, at the uh, victoria island mall the palms it will not have the same price as a book you find in yaba because they have different costs but over there if you're opening a mall you actually have different rates of rent because you need all types of businesses in your mall so you would have a place for bookshops where bookshops will bid to come and rent and you find out that the rent there is a fraction because you're looking for a multiplicity of businesses that will actually make the mall a community but in a, in a place that is purely mercantile the malls can't afford to do that so instead you have a place you have bookshops that are spending three times the rent of what their rivals are spending in yaba on ojo Lekba. and by inference they will not they will not sell the book at the same price so what we have here instead is called the recommended retail price where you advise the booksellers that this is the price. But then how do you pay royalties on a recommended r- retail price when you don't know the kind of revenue that is coming in? So most times you find here that the contracts here are, are tweaked. The contract here is tweaked slightly into... Oh, thank you, Damien. Thank you so much. That the contract here is tweaked slightly to refer recommended retail prices. That's what we do at Narrative Landscape Press. There I know some publishing houses that do on amount received, which is... On the on the cover price net on revenue net of trade discount, so let us say a publisher. Some publishers will tell you that they will pay you royalties ten percent net of trade discount. So if a publisher is selling the book for two thousand naira, bookshops will buy it from them for twenty percent discount, which is maybe about one thousand six hundred or twenty five percent discount, one thousand five hundred. They will pay you royalties on actual revenue, which means net revenue, which is revenue net of trade discount of the trade discount that they give to other people. That that accounting trickery, you have to look at it with clear eye and open eye, which means that for that kind of publisher, you'll be telling them that no, I would prefer 12% on revenue net of trade discount, so 10%. So you, so you enter with a clear eye. You enter with a clear eye. Um, um, no, no, not, not, not really, Damien. You don't usually have to sit down with legal counsel and trash out contract issues. It's a... It's, it's, See, one of the fears you have as a publisher is, 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 is a troublesome person. A business, a publishing is a collaborative industry. And you have to also understand that the most publishers, most, of course, there are crazy people there everywhere, but most publishers will be presenting, um, are presenting their boilerplate. It's the agreement that, that they work with. The arguments you're having about the negotiation you're having are about maybe one or two or three clauses. And these clauses, the, the boilerplate was prepared 
long spent a long time ago and has been working for them for a long time they will they are very 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 difficult for them to change or overhaul the way they want to work what most publishers will do for you is offer you a short explanation of what your questions are explain to you what those questions are and you yourself also have a duty as a writer to go and read because you have to understand that it's the world of uh, the world has kind of changed the information is out there there's no more I, i'm using gatekeeping a lot there's no more gatekeeping there's nothing like that idea of of uh, hey they're not telling me or, or i couldn't even find them to know it's everywhere it's your duty to turn that information glut into knowledge it's your duty to when you see a contract to look at it and go and research pop pop publishing make the work easier for both sides so about money so so the 10 percenting that we have been talking about now comes to um so 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 that 10 percent contract thing will now present itself as um so so what you now find is that the publisher the uh, so in terms of royalty rates you now have that argument about what exactly am i being paid on is it recommended retail price which is what we do where we tell you that okay we are planning to sell this book for two thousand naira, and we'll pay you ten percent of recommended retail price which means that you had any money on gross re- re- revenue when we're not touching your money so if the book is two thousand naira, you are getting ten percent of two thousand whether we sell that book for a thousand naira or a thousand three hundred a thousand two hundred or you are collecting your royalties net of trade discount where your royalties per book actual real royalty per book is changing and moving on a sliding scale depending on how much the publisher actually sold that book to booksellers and every other person most times try and push for that's it that's one of the things that you can negotiate and drag because you can say no sell it recommended retail price calculate my royalties recommended retail price i can't do i can't be going into your accounting to try and discover how much you actually sold the book this is what you're telling people to sell the book for even though you get into a shop and you see two five or five thousand or ten thousand recommended retail price is two thousand naira it's easier to calculate especially with international financial reporting standards that actually just work on gross and where discounts are an expense so it's just easier to just calculate on the gross revenue take your cut off the top and have that battle so the major point i'm making is that try and fight for the royalty rates as a calculation on the recommended retail price um now this idea of why that 10 percent is so small now let us calculate how much money let's calculate it, the hypothetical 2000 naira book so in a 2000 naira book you find out that you are going to be for you to be able to sell a book for 2000 naira trust me production cost this is from a point of view production cost cannot be above 500 naira that's 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 what we kind of think if your production cost cross 500 hours into 700 hours so you're already in trouble why because you will sell that 2000 naira book between 1500 to 1600 to most bookshops who will ask for 25 to 30 percent discount some bookshops will ask for 30 percent discount where you have to sell the book to them for 1400 naira hmm? now distributors who sell to bookshops who are going to be selling to a bookshop for 1400 naira 1500 and 1600 naira will collect the book for you from between 50 to 40 percent trade discount which means that you'll be selling the book to distributors for 1000 naira this 2000 naira book and 1200 naira now you are also paying the author 20 percent royalties which means that that 1000 naira now for distributors or whatever 200 naira has gone first of all so if you are selling to distributors which is ideal you are maybe selling that you're making you're maybe earning about 800 naira on a 500 naira production investment you have salaries <clears throat> you have salaries you have fuel you have diesel you are dragging basically between 300 naira to 500 naira to pay overheads and everything so you find out that your profits while the author is earning 200 naira you are maybe earning 200 naira yourself you say, but how can you be earning as much as the author well you have the book for only five to ten years the author has the book forever it's their rights it's what they do it's what they own it's theirs so during the time you're exploiting those rights it kind of makes sense that you earn for that short period of time slightly more or slightly an amount that makes you earn your money back 
Now, another thing that also happens in the contract are the, is the idea of subsidiary rights. This is where translation rights, um, electronic books are a specialized form of, a specialized form of, of, of um, subsidiary rights. So their royalty rates are kind of set in stone, 25 to 30% goes to the author. But most subsidiary rights, revenue is split 50-50. Translation rights, film, um, accepts and everything. If the, if the publisher can get your book accepted into the New Yorker, the New Yorker pays maybe 2000 or five, ten, ten, two thousand or three thousand dollars they will give you half the publisher takes half because the publisher is one that basically took a chance on this amorphous thing and made it into the in, in, into the book that, that that you have so most of these rates are kind of set in stone you can have margins the more you become popular the more your reputation becomes big where they know that they are not taking a chance where you're already a made thing then you can make younger then you can just make younger. You can tell them that no, I cannot do 10%. Please, I'm going to the next publisher. I know Casa Republic is pushing me. No, 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 I can't take this nonsense. Kachipo is offering me 12%. Now, about advances. This is really important. Now, advances, not be dash you. They are not dash you that money. Advances are what they are. Advances are advanced. The full sentence is advanced on royalties. And so, most times you find that you find that so if an author, if a publishing house offers you a 500,000 naira advance what is the function of the advance the function of the advance is to guarantee to the author that the publisher will die and make sure that he earns this money back that basically they will not just publish a book and keep it inside and not and not engage it and just let it rot in their own warehouse and take it as a loss they will try and earn their money back it's a good faith commitment to you so if a publishing house gives you a 500,000 naira advance You'll be receiving royalty statements of ten thousand naira, of a hundred thousand naira, of five hundred, of thirty thousand naira, until that five hundred thousand naira is complete. Then new money will start coming. Now, it's some ridiculous contracts. I've heard of some contracts that ask authors to refund advance on royalties. That's madness. Watch out for those clauses. So in case nothing happens, of course, I not said the book will give us money back. Chris, what happens in real life? What happens most times is that if the if the, if the if the publisher made a mistake and couldn't sell the books, oops, you've gained. But advances are not bonuses; they are basically advances on money that you will eventually earn for the publisher. They are advances on so you'll be getting royalty statements that will be showing you how the advance is coming down, basically in negative, showing how it's coming down on so the advance is all paid up, and you start receiving cash again. Um, so I don't know. I will try though. We've been chatting for forty-five minutes. Okay. What do I want to talk about now? Um, any new questions? So, so we've discussed publishing. We've discussed submissions. Um, so for the Nigerian space, what what are people looking for? Everybody's everybody's. Um, there's a, there's a publisher for everybody now. And most times you find that competition in a market so far, such as ours is actually more of collaboration. We compete in trying to get signatures for us also. We fight and drag those things. So. But you find that most times if you need, as a small publisher, as an independent press, if you need help, speak to your rival. They will show you how it's done. We, 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 we find ourselves learning new lessons, lessons that were basically lost during the dark decade of the 80s when the economy crashed. And in those lessons, we find ourselves reaching out, learning new accounting techniques, learning about accounting software, learning about warehousing, learning how to engage and how to make sure that, like when we started, when we actually merged from self-publishing into full tra traditional publishing, we spent the first six, to, six months to a year working out how to um, e efficiently calculate royalty rates, making sure that we paid attention to that because it's, it's, it can do such reputational damage for one person upset to carry your name and say no answer those people they're not they pay royalties you will spend the next 10 years trying to clean that up even if it was a mistake um so most times just reaching out and say please cassava how do you do this they will show you oh, see what we are we are doing there are not enough publishers they are not enough. We ask, we we try to fill up this space. We try to do our best. 
we try to make sure that as many voices exist. So which means that in other words, no matter what you've written in this creative space, there's a home for it. So um, thank you so much. It's Friday and my guys are waiting for me. My phone has been beeping. I had to go on Wi-Fi and t- turn off the phone call. We are going drinking. So I will turn some alcohol on the ground for my ancestors and for you guys. Thank you so much. It's been a great, great evening. Bye.